Welcome to Transform Now, the podcast brought to you by robotic process automation pioneer, Blue Prism. Digital transformation has the potential to reshape the way companies service their customers, engage their employees, and manage their operations. Whether you're looking to develop strategies, tactics, and best practices to positively impact the future of work, or you're curious to learn how other companies have successfully navigated their digital transformation programs, then this podcast is for you. We're here to help you transform now. Hello, everyone. I'm Brad Hairston with Blue Prism. Welcome to the Transform Now podcast. Today, I'm happy to have as my guest, Dr. Leslie Wilcox from the London School of Economics and the research and advisory firm, Knowledge Capital Partners, as well as Darshan Jain, who leads the financial services industry practice for Blue Prism in the Americas. I will be talking with Professor Wilcox and Darshan about the framework that Blue Prism and Knowledge Capital Partners have jointly developed to help companies understand and progress their digital maturity. Professor Wilcox and Darshan, thank you so much for joining me today. Let's start off with some introductions. Professor Wilcox. Yeah, uh, London School of Economics and Political Science, one of the leading research organizations in the world, university-wise. I've been looking at robotic process automation initially 2014, when I didn't know what it meant. And the last seven years, we've been doing a lot of work on that, how it connects up with digital transformation. And we've written five books so far on that, and we're just finishing another one on how it's leading to digital transformation. Very good. Darshan. Brad, thanks for having us uh, on your podcast today. Thrilled to be here. So as you mentioned, I head up the financial services practice that includes banking, FS, and insurance for the Americas at Blue Prism. And in this role, I guess what I've been trying to do with our VFSI customers is really provide some sense of direction where the automation community is going, where the technology is, what the next five years looks like. Uh, why, again, with COVID tailwinds, with the global situation where it is and labor hard to find these days, try to weave all of these into a narrative that our customers and prospects can really understand the value of digital labor. And that's where I actually met Professor Wilcox. In some of my research, I came across the work he did, and uh, we've been working ever since over the past several months. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, as robotic process automation has evolved over the past two decades, Many companies, as we know, who have invested heavily in this space are facing common challenges as they grow their automation footprint. These organizations are really eager to know how and where they can take their program to the next level, which has brought us to this whole idea of digital maturity. So I'm really excited to talk to you about this today. Let me start here. Can you both weigh in on you know, what are some of the big questions we're hearing from the automation focused senior executives these days? Let me start. And I know Professor Wilcox, you've got lots in your research uh, to talk about, but I'll give the perspective, Brad, of again, the BFSI customer. So when I talk to SVPs, EVPs, CIOs um, in some of our customer base, I guess I'll segment them, Brad, into sort of three buckets of customers. One, mature customers, people who started the journey five to eight years ago when sort of RPA made a big mainstream splash. The second bucket of customers is folks that are early in their journey, one or two years, still testing the waters, um, excited about what's to come. And then the third is folks who have yet to start the journey at all. And they're kind of saying, hmm, I think we should do something in this space. But really across the board, especially from our mature customers, what I'm hearing is, tell us, are we at the point in the journey where we should be? Darshan, tell us what does good look like? We've been four years, mm -hmm. five years, six years, we think we've accomplished a lot, but we don't know. You folks at Blue Prism, you have 2,000 customers, a, a lot in the BFSI space. Is what we're doing, is this good? We think it is, but we'd love, we'd love to have some external validation. And so from that perspective, they're asking, again, I would say about some empirical data. Sometimes traditionally it's called benchmarking, um, you know, down to some tactical questions. Well, we have 400 automations or robots that we've developed, but I have eight people now managing this robot fleet. Is eight the right number? Should I have more? Should I have less? Can you share some ratio? So we're talking empirical benchmark data, but also again, where we are on the journey, what does good look like? And so if those are the questions that mature folks are asking, 
there's a smaller subset of questions where people who are one year, two year, they're just talking about use cases still. And then the prospects, they say, why can't my IT team do this? Guys, why do I need robots in the first place? So you could see there's a full spectrum of questions that people are asking. And it really, again, this is where I get fascinated by trying to provide some of these answers. Professor Wilcox? I'm glad, Darshan, you divided up the different types of users and different types of questions. I just add that we focused on the mature users a lot, and we would divide them into two types. One is the leaders one, and the other one is uh, mature, but you know, want getting there, but not there at all yet, really, in their own minds. And about 20% of users of this kind of automation are leaders. And so that means 80% aren't. Now, looking just at the ones that we were researching, they, there's still a lot of questions. I'll, I'll, I'll focus on three, just to add to what Darshan did. The first question we get, not from the leaders necessarily, but further down, is how do we scale? And we think, you surely you know how to do that. You've been doing it long enough. And as even mature users sometimes come to a point where they say, we're, we can't go on with this. And when you go into them, they say they've got enterprise automation and they actually have silos of automation around the enterprise. And that's what they call enterprise automation. It's not joined up enterprise in any way. So uh, a lot of them, they, they scale to a certain point and then they hit a bump and they say, going on is going to cost us an awful lot. We've got nice gains. Let's, let's keep them. Let's get some more of those efficiency gains but we're not going to make this investment because we don't know the value of making these further investments. And by the way, we kept getting told this is a tactical technology, which we don't think at all is the case as we'll reveal later on. But what they're hitting really, essentially the ones who are running into difficulties is what I call silos, organizational silos. And those come in seven forms, really. There are process silos, structured silos, technology silos, data silos, skills silos, culture silos, and managerial mindset silos. So that's one question that we get. Another one is how does automation link with our digital transformation efforts? And what we're finding there is that apart from the real leaders, most organizations are making two separate efforts. One is called automation which escalates into having a center of excellence. And the other one is digital transformation. They don't really talk to one another or know very much about each other. They get funded differently. They get o different ownership, different governance, sometimes tenuous links. A and that is a real problem. And the thing that Darshan and I are working on is how you link those two efforts up so that they're synergistic and the real value it, it emerges. I think the third question is, how do we know the value of automation? We did a lot of work on navigating and steering and measuring because most organizations are prisoners of their measurement systems and they rely upon return on investment, total cost of ownership. And the result is that they get locked into efficiency gains, increases in productivity, less input for more out. Put. And they, as a result, do not produce effectiveness doing things right, doing right things. And they do not create a, a, an enablement platform that gives the business major options, including strategic options, like we'll go into a different business or go into a different product, develop a new service. So when they don't know the value of automation and the value that organizations are producing, and a lot of our work, Darshan has shown the value of automation at the enablement level, then uh, they, they won't make the investment. Interesting. So it's fascinating that companies are treating automation and digital transformation as separate, disconnected initiatives. That's really amazing. Darshan, how did all this lead to the creation of a digital maturity index and what are its goals? So if you think back to the questions that both of us have just said, Brad, there's a lot of questions out there and there's no framework. There's no point of reference. So again, I'll just speak from a blue prism point of view, 2000 customers, roughly 45% are in the BFSI space globally. That's a massive amount of customers. Many of them, big global logos. 
these are not some newbies that are saying, well, let's experiment. These folks, again, just are global organizations. And everything that Professor Wilcox just mentioned, I found it just fascinating. Why isn't there some way to link your journey on digital transformation or DX for short with the value of automation? If we're still looking at automation in terms of pure ROI and human displacement and human workers being freed up, we're missing some of the major linkages to a more DX friendly organization. The customer journey, Professor Wilcox, you mentioned the entire business model. I'll give you one example, Brad. Amazon started off as a ebook retailer. They were the first in the late nineties to come up and saying, Hey, you don't have to go to Barnes and Noble. You could buy a book online. It's just a physical book. We just cut out the, the branches and the stores. Great. Today of the $1.8 billion in profit that they declared in the last quarter, about 80% of it came from nothing to do with retailing goods at all. It came from an entirely new business model called AWS or Amazon web services, which is powering the world's transition to the cloud. They are the biggest name. How did this happen? Well, it happened because Professor Wilcox, you mentioned new business models, new innovation, new thinking. Amazon was getting so big that they said nobody could provide the data servers. So we needed to create our own. When they did, they were so good at it. They said, we have some extra capacity. Why don't we lend it out? And in lending it out, it created an entire new business model. Brad, this is digital transformation at its heart. Again, three tenets of that. Sure, digitize your processes, no problem. But what about the customer? And what about new ways of working, new ways of thinking, new business models? All of these put together led to a digital maturity assessment tool or an index that combines a customer's ability to automate and execute its automation ambition. And on another axis, looks at its ability to grasp digital transformation. So we're looking on one axis, how are mature are you in terms of digital thinking? But on another axis, how able are you to actually simply grab hold of automation and make it happen? So the ability to strategize digitally and execute automationally, I just invented that, is the cross-section of what our digital maturity is all about. And it's been fascinating what the results so far have been. The assessment has two major parts, one focused on strategy, the other on execution. Let's dive deep on each of those, if we could. And Professor Wilcox, let me let you start and talk about the digital strategy maturity assessment. Yeah. And by the way, I think Darshan has indicated the high profile successful example of a, a digital platform, an enablement platform, which is Amazon, but there are many other organizations. I mean, they're fascinating because their digital transformation has been continuous over, over 20 years. And when people say we're done with digital transformation, they don't understand what they're talking about because it's a continuous evolution because you're trying to converge digital technologies and it's the convergence that produces the power. And Amazon is just a prime example of merging both business know-how and customer focus with digital technologies. And it's a fabulous example, but there are lots of others that, that we banged into. So we've been looking at this. We have over 860 cases and growing every week of successful RPA, intelligent automation, digital transformation. We, we decided that where it was moving towards was this convergence and the digital transformation thing. You've got to remember, um, digital transformation is, um, it's got a high fail rate, projects abandoned, not, uh, continued with not delivered the goods partially done. It's going down. Good news. It's gone down about 10% and the fail rate is now about 65% not 75%, but we're getting better at it. But what we're trying to do here is, is we've looked at all the cases and we now know why organizations succeed. We're not saying it's easy, by the way. And you, when I just tell you what you have to do, you'll be clear that it's a very hard work indeed. But as long as you're doing the right things and building the right core capabilities, then you're going to get there. That's the point. And uh, as long as you have the business now as well, to point it in the right direction, this wonderful technology that you're creating, then you're going to be very good. 
And if you're not very good, you're going to fall behind irreversibly. That's one of the great findings from our research and several other people's actually. So this is not something that they should not be doing. They should really be entering this full heartedly uh, in 2022. So anyway, we managed to tease out really after a lot of painstaking work, seven core capabilities for delivering digital transformation. And I'll, I'll briefly highlight what they are. There, one is digital strategy. Another one is integrated planning. Another one, which is massively overlooked is embedded culture. You really have to change the culture of an organization to be much more digital. Governance is another one. We find that there is never enough centralized, coordinated governance. Another one is the digital platform itself. But you've got to remember, I hope this is getting home, that we find time and again that technology is only 25% of the challenge. 75% is organizational and managerial. And you can read this into the seven core capabilities because the other two are change management, which is a massive effort. You should be spending much more on that actually than on the technology. And the final one, the missing piece that most people do not get is navigation. We now recognize that it's a core capability and you cripple yourself if you don't do good navigation in real time. We break that down into 27 sub activities and produce a very, very granular analysis of where an organization is, how it compares to other organizations in the sector and across sectors, and what you need to prioritize over the next year. I, I was been amazed at how we could do this so quickly, Darshan, in four months. And the reason was we were ready for it. Excellent. Darshan, why don't you take us into the other side, which is around automation execution capability. Talk about that piece of the assessment. Sure, Brad. So again, as Professor Wilcox just said, that in his research, the way he was able to quickly say, okay, Darshan, there are seven core capabilities. If a company is going to be mature digitally, where do they stand on these seven core capabilities? For us at Blue Prism, the same question is around automation. And so the ability to execute on automation really depends at the core of it on our robotic operating model, as that we are absolutely the pioneers in a robotic operating model, which we created a decade ago. It is the absolute map, if you will, of how a company needs to set up its infrastructure, set up its thinking to be successful in an automation future. And so we drew upon the resources within the, the robotic operating model, also known as the ROM, and we pulled from there five core capabilities. And these are the pipeline of opportunities of ideas, the delivery of actual automations or robots, the service model. How are you going to now manage this robotic delivery or this robotic uh, army? The technology itself, how are you managing the underlying infrastructure? And of course, the fifth one is people. How are you keeping them abreast? How are you continuing to invest in them and so on? So these five core capabilities break then down into 22 leading indicators in terms of looking at each one. Some have only two or three in these categories, some have five or six. And so if you look at this, really what the assessment does is it looks at Professor Wilcox's a framework of the seven, we break that into 27 leading indicators. And then on the automation side, we take the five and we break them into 22. So roughly we have 50 leading indicators that we ask a company to participate in. Going back to the idea of the silos, we'll look at these roughly 50 indicators on a scale for every company and no company is going to be similar to another. We'll then graph them into a classic two by two scatter plot to say, which quadrant do you follow? Darshan, is the assessment only focused on current state? That's a great question, Brad. So when we were designing this, and again, relying on some of the work that Professor Wilcox and KCP folks have done, but also, you know, our own thinking, we thought it was short-sighted to simply say, suppose, Brad, you were an EVP, uh, maybe a, a chief uh, digital officer, one of our core audiences, and we would say, so tell us, Brad, where your organization is. We thought that since we're having a few minutes of your time, and as you go through this assessment, why not also ask, where would you like to be, Brad, a year from now? Because we have your attention. 
And when we sort of test marketed this idea with a few beta customers, they said, of course. And what we found is that almost always, like 95% of the time, people would like to be better than where they are today. Folks are being quite transparent and honest where they are in the journey as they go through the assessment. And then they actually say, but in 12 months time, which is not a future that no one can understand. It's just 12 months from now. Where would you like to be? And people are saying, I'd like to be better by whatever degree of, of improvement. And so, no, we have both current state and what I call a desired state 12 months hence. Darshan, where can companies get access to the assessment and how long does it take to complete? Right now in our beta phase, we're still just ramping up. What we've done is we said, if anybody's interested in having their accounts participate in this, I just reach out to me. And what we'll do is we'll set up a 30 minute walkthrough of an introduction to Spectrum. What's the problem is trying to solve many of the things, Brad, you're asking exactly about. And we then walk them through the structure of it. And we talk to them about, this is what the reports are going to get. And here's some of the insights. So some sample insights. If at the end of that brief intro in 30 minutes or less, they're saying, Hey, Darshan and co I'd like to participate. Then what we'll do is we'll simply send them a brochure. It's a 10 page PDF. Embedded in that PDF are links to an online platform. And there are two assessments. Remember, Professor Wilcox has helped us build the digital maturity side. And then there's also a separate assessment for what we call the automation execution capability. So we ask customers who would like to participate to complete this online. So let's talk about the roles in the company that you're targeting to complete each part of the assessment. Professor Wilcox, perhaps you could start and talk about the digital strategy maturity component. Who are you targeting? Yeah, these are the senior executives, might even be board level, but people who essentially you want informants who are knowledgeable of a particular issue. Uh, you know, I often said, you know, uh, I'd rather interview the one person who knows everything about the organization than 200 people who know very little. I, I just... I've done this time and again, by the way, you know, I've gone into organizations and said, look, who knows everything? Sometimes it was the desk assistant who'd been there for 30 years and knows everything. It's not necessarily the senior guy or girl, but in this case, it, it usually is. It's the CIO and all those other names that flow out from the CIO, like chief digital officer, chief innovation officer, chief knowledge officer. I think there are so many acronyms these days. I've lost count, uh, but. Essentially, it's going to be people who own digital transformation, you know, who are responsible for delivering this in some way or other. It might be the, the sponsor. It might even be the chief executive. It might be the project champion, you know, the, the senior exec who has credibility to get things done, who can put the vision forward and keep checking up. Uh, or it might even be the project manager, a lower level, but detailed person who's uh, getting the thing done. So all these are, are feasible roles. It might even be the head of the automation center of excellence, who's has already tapped into digital transformation and knows that what the link should be. Darshan on the automation execution side, what does that look like? So similar to what professor Wilcox just mentioned, we definitely want to ask people who are in the know. And so. If on the strategy side, it is the chief innovation, chief digital officer, those folks that have that broad understanding of their digital strategy, when we're looking at automation, we're looking very tactically. Do you understand the platform? Do you have a good idea of change management? Do you understand how to manage a growing fleet of robots within your organization? So our focus in the automation side, just the nature of it, you have to know the ground game very well. And so for us, that audience typically is the center of excellence or similar names. Who owns in an organization, the automation uh, platform and the people around it? It could be a centralized group in a large company. If it's a federated model, it could be business units. And suppose like some of our customers have a dozen centers of automation because they have a federated model and no two are the same. So we would go to each of those dozen to say, reflect on your own journey. Where are you? And please complete this. We'll then put a composite together and create this for, as a composite for the organization. But 
in general, it's the automation center of excellence folks. And again, not just one, not just the head, but we'd like to get a variety of perspectives. It could be the person who delivers. It could be the process analyst, could be the infrastructure manager. We'd like to get at least five plus perspectives on that because it's really interesting. Sometimes we find that the head of automation may think they're not doing so well and we'd like to do more. And on the other hand, they say, we're doing great. And the team says, I don't think so. So even that diversity in perspective is valuable insight into a company's uh, journey. So what does the output of the process look like? Darshan, perhaps you could start explaining that for us. We have about four major categories of output, Brad, and, uh, and these apply equally to both um, sides. We'll drill into both the automation axes as well as the digital strategy axes. But in general, these four buckets are, number one, where are you from a two by two scatter plot? So think of uh, Gartner's famous magic quadrant and, and uh, most of the analyst teams use some form of a two by two plot. It's a very straightforward analysis and you want to be typically in the upper right quadrant, which we call the leaders. And so simply where are you in that quadrant is our first output, uh, which looks at digital maturity matched against automation execution capability. And the higher you are on the X axis, the higher you are on the Y axis gets you to that upper right. So that's our first output. We then drill down into that on both of the axes by looking at, okay, so in the seven capabilities for digital maturity or the five on the automation side, where are you in current state? Where would you like to be in a desired state? And by the way, how do you compare against similar folks in your industry? And so these three data points are given for each of these. That's the second category. The third one is we drill further into those, Brad, by going down to the leading indicator level and to say again, where are the biggest gaps? So the final one, the fourth piece is focused advice. And we'll pick maybe four or five key areas that an organization clearly is lacking in, and we'll give them some advice into that based on a lot of the research that Professor Wilcox has done and a lot that we know at Blue Prism from our robotic operating model and the experience we've had. So those are the four areas that we provide output in. Brad, Darshan, I'll add to that on focused advice, if I may, because I worked in management consultancy for about 10 years. And the two hard lessons I learned was that management consultants assume two things. One is that there is such a thing as best practice. And the second thing is that organizations can execute best practice. Um, and this benchmark diagnostic is designed with not those assumptions in mind, but completely different ones. So first of all, we find out where they are. We then assume that it's totally unrealistic to expect an organization to become a best practice organization within two years. They're not going to. That's a best practice fallacy. So we don't recommend best practice to them. We know what it is. What we do is we say, here you are, these are your weaknesses, these are your strengths, where do you want to prioritize in the coming year? And have you got the resources and ability to actually deliver that in the next year? And by the way, if you want to, we'll come back and measure you next year and then we can evolve forward. So our, our analysis provides very focused advice. It's highly customized to the context, the capabilities, but also the incapabilities of the organization. Let me ask you both, why is digital maturity so important to measure? Brad, the reason digital maturity is so important is that people have been adopting technology for technology's sake without understanding how it fits into the bigger picture. So if I go back to the three tenets of digital transformation, it is about what does your customer want from you? And more and more, we are a digitally enabled consumer marketplace, and even a B2B marketplace. We want a frictionless environment and a frictionless interaction. If I can do it on my mobile phone, please don't make me have to call you. So the entire customer experience, a digital seamless frictionless is one key tent. Another one, of course, is just the more loops you have that involve humans in your processes, the more you're going to get stuck, whether it's a COVID pandemic, whether it's shortage of labor 
whether it's a lack of talent and skills. If we can remove that and find great things for humans to do, let the robots do the mundane the stuff. The third thing, as we talked about in the Amazon example, is companies that don't reinvent themselves, don't find adjacent markets, new markets, completely new business models, they will go away. Do I have to say BlackBerry five times? We have to <laughs> innovate. So going back to those three tenants, again, that's why digital maturity is so important, providing this framework for companies to say, this is where you are, this is where the destination is. Again, making an assumption that you want to get to the destination, which is some form of success being digitally transformed. And then, as Professor Wilcox said, whether it's a two-year journey, a five-year journey, heck, a 10-year journey, please, whatever your speed, be on this journey. And our job is to help guide you. And so that's why we think having some sense of framework is so important. Professor Wilcox, I'm sure you have much more to add. Well, I think measurement's got a bad name because people are measuring what people aren't interested in. Uh, you know, organizations are really not interested in measuring the past. And that's what most measurement systems do. What they're interested in is where are we? Where the hell are we? And where are we going? And if you don't know that, you have a real problem. I'm part of what was a maritime empire before the British empire, there was the Spanish empire. And you will know as the North Americans that Columbus found himself uh, in the middle of the Atlantic ocean at some stage, and he could move north to south because they understood latitude. They had no idea about longitude. Uh, and it, it was only in the 1720s onwards when John Harrison in the U U Britain, he, he, he spent 20 years designing reliable clocks, five clocks in 20 years. They were hugely expensive, but they helped you to find out where you were um, going west and east. Well, we know that Columbus got it a bit wrong, but this is the problem. If you're not actually got latitude and longitude, you, you don't know where you are and you don't know where you're going and you don't know how far it is. And it, it, it's, it sounds ludicrously simple, but you know, in those days, in the 1750s, why globalization took off was because they had sextants, almanacs, and chronometers. And then they gradually improved that and made them industrialized and cheap and reliable. Uh, and you will find that from that date, globalization really does progress. And it was about navigation. My case rests, really. Digital transformation is, is the same thing. Darshan, you mentioned that Blue Prism customer response to the assessment has been very positive thus far. Can you perhaps share an example or two of a Blue Prism customer that has taken it and how it benefited them? So I'll give you an example of a very large asset management firm, uh, a global logo, if you will. And they've been a customer of, of Blue Prisms for a few years now and good progress, pretty happy. But when I pose this exactly what Professor Wilcox and I have been mentioning to you. They said, yeah, we'd be very curious. So they participated and we did a live briefing in about 30 minutes and shared the results with them. And their remarks were very insightful, Brad. So their head of, of automation and his boss, uh, the head of uh, transformation, uh, and then their teams that had participated were all there. And he said, Darshan, you know, last year we spent $10 million on all of this stuff whether it's platform or it's people, we made investments because we knew it was the right thing. But frankly, we were going on hope and prayer that this is the right investment to make. Your assessment really validates that we're on that right journey because it turned out that while they had major gaps, they were already in some cases on their way. And so he wanted to take this to the CIO to say, look, this is worth the investment we've made. We have already progressed. And they're actually looking forward to the next measurement cycle, whether it's six months or 12 months from now, to see if that investment pays off. So that's one insight uh, for you, how a customer, again, a, a global asset management firm saw this. I'll give you one other one. A large life insurance company, one of the oldest brands in North America, they've had significant changeover in their automation team. And a new SVP was appointed and I got to know her very recently. And I suggested that as one way to understand what the future looks like, because she said she has just so many holes to plug that whether it was people, it was morale issues. 
she said she presented the, the promise of automation to the C-suite and they said, make it happen. You have our full support, but she didn't know where to begin. So I said, how about we begin with this assessment? Give us a chance to tell you where you are and where you want to be. And she said, that sounds like a plan. And they did. When you walk into a shopping mall, the exit says you are here in the shopping mall and you want to get to Nordstrom, here's the path. They have this map now and they're actually going to start executing against this again, where there's gaps, where they're already excelling, where to focus their efforts. So here's two examples for you, how immediately just in a short time frame, two large logos of ours have really embraced uh, the concept of digital maturity. Excellent. Those are great examples. Thank you for sharing those. Professor Wilcox and Darshan, it's been a pleasure talking with both of you today about the new digital maturity index. This should definitely be a true game changer in terms of helping organizations establish a North Star in their automation journey. Many thanks for joining me today and be well. Thanks, Brad. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks, Brad. It's been great. Thanks for tuning in to Transform Now. For more insightful discussions on digital transformation and more, check out our podcast channel where you'll find all of our previous episodes. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player. And if you like what you heard, please leave us a review. For more information about digital transformation and the future of work, check out blueprism.com to learn how Blueprism's digital workforce is enabling enterprise transformation now.